Welcome to the Over 40 Alpha Podcast with your host, Funk Roberts. We are live. We are live. We are live. And welcome to the Over 40 Alpha Podcast. This is episode number 77. And I am your host, Funk Roberts. I'm known around the world as a guy who helps men in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and beyond get in the best shape of their lives through workouts, nutrition, uh, it, naturally increasing testosterone and balancing hormones, recovery, mindset, and everything to do with men's health. And I'm excited that you're here. And that's what we talk about on this podcast. And, uh, you know, before we start today, I'm really excited, actually, because we've got a good friend of mine. His name is Frank Rich. And uh, Frank Rich, although he's in the fitness world, he has a lot of clout in the fitness world and things that he's done. He has rebuilt himself and rebuilt his uh, his 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 uh his professional, his company, his vision to help men break free from the shackles of porn addiction through the power of faith and fitness. So keeping that fitness in play, but really and truly focusing more on porn addiction. And his story is incredible. Uh, You know, there's a lot of men out there who struggle with porn addiction, not just men over the age of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, but how it's, how it's affecting our kids, how it's affecting our grandchildren, you know, as, as men over 40, um, as, as alpha men, we need to not only break free from our shackles. If, if any, anybody out there listening struggles with porn addiction, but how do we have that conversation with our kids? How do we have that conversation with our grandchildren? How do we have that conversation and bring light to it as opposed to keeping it in the dark? Because when you struggle with things like porn addiction, it affects everything in your life. In fact, your life becomes unmanageable. And when your life becomes unmanageable, that means you're in addiction. You're addicted to something that's taking away from your life. And we need to, we need to, to bring that back. And so Frank Rich, superhuman Frank Rich, is going to take us through uh, his journey, take us through how we can... Uh, break free from the shackles and also what he's doing to help more and more men rebuild and recover from porn addiction. And, uh, you know, I'm really excited about this. This is something that not a lot of people will talk about openly, but I need, it needs to be talked about. It really does. It needs to be a household word because it is so powerfully thrown into anyone's everyday life. It comes for you. Porn, porn comes to you. And we're not talking about old school porn like, like you know, when, when I was younger, because I'm 52. So, you know, it used to be the it used to be Betamax. You know, you get a Betamax, you get it on a satellite, you know, and you'd watch uh, American Triple Ecstasy or whatever it was. But it wasn't, it was, it wasn't like readily available. You had to, you know, magazines, you had to search, you had to find, you had to grind, you had to dig, you had to figure out if your buddy of yours has something, and then all you guys get together and 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 just watch or whatever. It wasn't something that was um readily available like it is now. Like literally in one second, I can go to anywhere and, and Instagram and porn can be, and if I click one thing, it can be served right in my, my entire search. All of the things that come down can be all related to one picture of a, a butt or one picture of, you know, side boob or whatever it is. It's insane. And it's coming for it for everybody. If we're, if we're not, if we're not shining a light. So Frank's going to shine a light before Frank shines that light. If you need help with your fitness, with your health, it's, it's 2022, it's January. Everyone has, you know, our, 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 our resolutions, our goals, what have you. Fitness is always up there, but it's always the one that, 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 that always gets, uh, you know, thrown to the side. Then definitely 100% uh, join over40alpha.com. It's $1, guys, 30 days. I'm going to hook you up. I'm going to make sure you lose 7 to 20 pounds in 30 days joining the Over 40 Alpha Brotherhood and then joining 10,000 men over the age of 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, all over the world, completely transforming their lives, completely changing their lives with monthly workout, follow along workouts. We've got weekly coaching 10 a.m. Sunday, every, every Sunday, we do a weekly live coaching call. I mean, it's an insane program and uh, you get all access for $1. So go to over 40 alpha.com and get on that. But for now, let's talk uh, about, Oh, the other thing too, before we, before we go into it, I just want to make sure that if you're listening to this right now, I want you to get that this link. Uh, Frank has a seven-step guide to living life without porn. It's a free ebook. And if you go to the sevenstepguide.com, 
So the seven step die.com forward slash opt in. It's a free ebook. Of course, you're gonna have to give your email, but you do want to give your email because you want more information from Frank. You want Frank to help you because that's what he's doing. He's helping men out there. And this is not sex addiction. Sex addiction and porn addiction are two different things. They're two different types of addiction. It's like alcohol and narcotics, two different types of addiction. So really, truly um, get that, get that set, the, the TH7 S-E-V-E-N step guide to dot com forward slash opt in and uh, jump on that right now and uh, sit back, listen up and uh, let's break free from the shackles of porn. Get it done. We are live. We are live. We are live. And I am super excited today to have my good friend, Frank Rich in the house. You know, Frank and I've known each other for many, many years, um, you know, met each other here in Toronto and then, you know, back and forth online. And, and um, you know, I was on Frank's podcast and, you know, Frank, Frank's done a lot in, in the world of hip, in, uh, in the world of, of fitness, you know, regarding uh, your muscle building program, certified trainer, nutrition coach, bodybuilder, entrepreneur, building a massive, a massive following and helping so many men build this masthetic physique, right? The, I remember that masthetic physique, man. I love that. I love it. I love it. Um, and now the transformation into, you know, taking something that, that really affected you in your life and, and now sharing that and helping others is incredible. And this is kind of like a, a one of those taboo um, conversations and topics that not a lot, it's not, it's not very comfortable for people. You know, it's comfortable for people who are, in addiction or using or in a specific, you know, strip joint or whatever, but it's not something that you want to, you know, talk about openly. It's something that we hide. And so today Frank is going to take us through porn addiction and how that affects us, how that affects men and how that affects our kids as well. So thank you so much for being on the podcast, Frank. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great, brother. Good to see you, man. I'm, uh, you know, really looking forward to to this conversation, man. Just great to see your face, hear your voice again. Yeah. Glad you, you know, you've kicked that, uh, that COVID thing, man. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to, you know, I want to honor you, man. I, you know, I, I appreciate you for opening up, you know, your podcast here for this conversation. You hit on a couple of things here right at the beginning. It is a taboo conversation. It is something that we try to keep secret. And I think just knowing that it's like, okay, let's open up the box there and kind of talk about the elephant in the room. Like, why is it so taboo? Why is it such a secret? And, and, and I just want to maybe kind of set, you know, the preface here. Like, I'm not going to come at this from a, you know, from a morality standpoint. Yes, I am. You know, I am a believer here. It's a big part my faith is a big part of my life and my story that we've you know got to this point but i don't want this to be a like good versus bad conversation it's not something i'm really interested in and i think that's where a lot of people come when they hear this conversation they're immediately thinking like if they've been consuming porn or if they've been watching porn like we're judging them and that's not where i'm going to come i'm hopefully going to be able to provide a little bit of insight a little bit of education on some of the science what it's doing to our brain um and then i'll kind of let you see where where we want to go here Nan. but uh, but I'm, I'm grateful for you for opening up your platform here today to have this conversation so thank you no problem i mean it's very exciting so let's start with you like who like you know how did you get in the the fitness industry first and then how did this occur like how did how did that transformation into into porn addiction um occur yeah no great question you know fitness has been you know really been a part of my life forever you know growing up i was you know i was an athlete i was a competitive athlete you know all through you know elementary school into little league into high school you know i was you know multi you know letter multi sports in 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 high school i didn't go beyond that you know i don't have a resume like yourself of traveling the world playing professional sports but you know i competed at a moderately high level you know through my through my teenage and in high school years um, but at the same time, like I also kind of always cared like a little bit of, of extra fluff. Like there was no talk about nutrition or healthy eating, like kind of, kind of growing up, you know, we ate dinner out of the box many nights, you know, we ate what was there and readily available. So, you know, I definitely struggled with, I guess you would say maybe some confidence issues kind of as I was getting into my teenage years, like not really comfortable taking the shirt off, even though I was like a high performing athlete, I had that kind of like a little bit of layer of, of fluff on the outside. So when I graduated high school, like I made one commitment, like when I left the small town where I was going to school and I said, the next time these people from this town see me, they're going to see a completely different body. Um, so it was that first summer right out of high school, man. You know, I joined a, I joined a 24-hour world gym fitness, um, and I just fell in love with it, man. You know, I, obviously you can see I got a couple posters of Arnold uh, behind me here. You know, the, the the Arnold's bodybuilding encyclopedia was one of the first books uh, that I ever picked up, and I still got it. You can see it on the corner here, right, 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 right behind me. But so I fell in love with it, you know, right right out of the gate, man. And I mean, that first summer out of high school, my body 
change. I mean, I probably dropped 20 pounds of fat, probably put on 25 pounds of muscle. I mean, it was rapid. And I, and I, and I realized then that I had, you know, the proclivity to put muscle on, not at a like very easy level. Like I'm not a pro bodybuilder, IPB, but the ability for me to grow and get stronger was something that I was gifted with. So I fell in love with it, man, you know, right at, right at 18, 19 years old. And it stuck with me, you know, until my, till my mid twenties. So, you know, I, I, attended school you know university here for 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 two semesters i knew that schooling wasn't going to be for me we'll probably get into kind of my entrepreneur journey here as well later on today but um you know through corporate america in my you know my early 20s and just kind of landing small time jobs like i started writing programs for people just just on the side you know i'd gotten you know a at that time, it was the ISSA certification, just because I wanted to kind of educate myself a little better. So, you know, I started just kind of writing programs for my friends and people that would ask for me. And then when I was 24, um, I got hired at a local gym here, huge gym franchise. They're, they're no longer around. They sold to LA Fitness. Um, but that was my first taste of like working, I guess you could say in the fitness industry. So I was a, you know, I was a weekend sales manager, selling membership, selling personal training, kind of bringing people in into the gym. A for one, I realized like the fitness industry has the ability to make a lot of money. You know, we, like I was making six figures, you know, 24, 25 years old, just selling gym memberships. So I was like, okay, there's something to this as well. And that's when I got introduced to the sport of bodybuilding. So I met my first coach. I met my first trainer around 25, started competing. This would have been 2008. So from 2008 till, you know, really when I met you, which would have been 2017, I identified as a competitive bodybuilder. Like it was a big part of who I thought I was and who I wanted people to see me as. And it stems from a lot of that insecurity that I had with a, with a young, when I was a young kid growing up, because I thought if people would see me and respect me as this big, strong kind of alpha masculine man, then I would immediately earn their respect. Um, so for me, it, it became like the core part of who I was training, bodybuilding, now, I left the gym industry uh, shortly after 2009. Um, so 2010 to 2013, I was very successful in kind of corporate America. I was doing corporate recruiting, uh, high level, you know, high level stuff there, making a lot of money. But I found myself after like a year and a half, you know, I was making 150, almost $200,000 a year. Like any free moment I had was spent researching bodybuilding, was spent researching training, was writing programs for my friends. So I knew back then that the corporate thing, like working for somebody else, building somebody else's dreams was not for me. So in 2013, I exited from, from corporate America and I got into entrepreneurship. Um, I didn't jump immediately into the fitness industry because I didn't really know the path to create your own business there, but I know I wanted like to create my own schedule. So I launched a ticket brokerage, like nothing to do with fitness. I had some people that were in the industry, so I had some contacts. Basically, I became like a smaller version of a StubHub. We had a platform where you could buy and sell uh, your own tickets. We invested a lot of our own money into packages packages and, and, and tickets globally here. So that, that was 2013 to 2017. That gave me the taste of like freedom as an entrepreneur. But what it also gave me was a lot of extra time, you know, a lot of extra time to dedicate to my own training, a lot of extra time to start kind of building a small kind of like little online business, I guess you could say. And then at the end of 2016, I got an email from Vince Del Monte, very, you know, very close friend and, and, and mentor, both of ours. And it was, they were promoting their hypertrophy. It was him and Ben. They were promoting their hypertrophy max launch. Um, and I said, wait a minute, like, how are these guys doing this? Like, how did, how did this, you know, skinny guy savior partner up with this IFBB bro? I knew Ben personally, like Ben lives here in Tampa or did at the time lived in Tampa and we trained at the same gym. I said, how are they, you know, how are they making money selling this program? So I reached out to Vince. And maybe I think he had maybe a YouTube video or something where he was talking about his zero to six figure formula seminar. So, OK, maybe there's something here. Like I've seen this guy on YouTube for years. You know, I'm sure a lot of your audience knows Vince. Like I didn't go to Vince for muscle building knowledge. Like I went to him because he had taken that knowledge and from what seemed like from the outside had built a very successful life. So I was curious. And I said, hey, what's up with this coaching stuff that you're doing? What's up with the zero to six figure thing? Um, and at the time he didn't have the mastermind, which I'm now a part of. He didn't have anything other than, yeah, I do some one-on-one -on -one coaching. I think it was 1500 bucks a month, or you could pay for six months in full for 7,500. And I was like, 
let's go. You know, like I'm, I'm all about this. I like what you're saying. So I hired Vince in the early 2000, January, 2017 to help us build what you now you know, mentioned at the beginning was our masthetic muscle. And then that led us to, you know, July of that summer, which was, I believe when I met you at that first event in, in Toronto. Um, so that's the story, man. You know, I was, I was an athlete growing up. I fell in love with fitness. It became a huge part of my identity. I, you know, I competed at a, you know, somewhat high level here, uh, placed fourth in the state of Florida in 2016. Um, and then always had, you know, the heart and drive to be an entrepreneur. So through, I guess, resourcefulness, I pieced it all together and I landed, you know, at the doorstep of, of Vince Del Monte and the rest has kind of been history. Yeah, I mean, you and I have a similar story. First of all, bodybuilding is um, extremely high level um, sport because I, my wife used to be a bodybuilder and I know how dedicated, like I was a professional athlete, but nowhere near as dedicated in regards to how dedicated you need to be to step on, on stage. Like that's, I think that, I think bodybuilding would probably be at that like the highest level of dedication that you need in order to step on that scale, because you don't, you can't miss an inch, missing an inch, missing a little bit is, is the difference between first place, second place, 10th place, or what have you. And knowing that everyone else is, is, is doing what they need to do. I, I consider that highest level specifically in the fitness community, fitness industry. And then, yeah. yeah. No, I was going to say, I, I, I agree partially, you know, part of me like doesn't really look at bodybuilding, like the actual competition as a sport. Like, I really think it's a pageant. Like, I think the sport is the preparation leading you to, to get there. But you, you hit something on the head there. Like, you know, as a, as a professional volleyball player, like nobody's going to know if you ate some extra fries at dinner or nobody's going to know if you put some cheese on, you know, the hamburger or whatever. The bodybuilding competition, like if if, if you eat the extra fry, if, if you have the ice cream when you're not supposed to, everybody's going to know. Yeah, totally. And, and even fighting too. Like when I fought in Thailand, it was like, yeah, you could, you, you, you know, I train many fighters, high level fighters, UFC fighters, and, you know, sometimes they're, sometimes talent will outdo the hard work that you need, right? Like mm. MMA specifically, you need to know so many different disciplines. Muay Thai, you just need to know Muay Thai, but you still have to have that conditioning. You still have to go for the runs. You still have to do all those things because when you step into that, that ring, someone's trying to knock you out, kick you in the head, you know, and so, but it's still, it's still, you can still get away with not doing everything you need to do. Whereas bodybuilding, you know, you can't. So that's one thing. The second thing I love is we do have a similar story because you were in the corporate world, realizing your passion was fitness because every single moment you had, you were researching like I, every single moment I had, I was researching fitness and I had a blog and I was doing everything and I was making six six figures and I was in the president's club. And then I just ended up saying, you know what, if I want to do my passion and not, not, not work for someone else's dream, then I'm going to have to go into my president's office and say, Hey man, I'm, I'm leaving. And, um, you know, and then just go and then bet on yourself and do everything you can, which we, I, I was already doing. It sounds like you were already doing. And then, yeah, meeting you was great. I remember meeting you at Vince's, you're jacked. I was like, I love this guy, man. I absolutely love this guy. I think I like came up to you and I was like, <laughs> I'm a very touchy guy. So anyway, so, so I, I love, I love that story. So how old are you right now? How old are you? I'm um, 38. Okay. 38. So, and you're in Tampa. So, um, so where did, where did porn come into all of this? When did it, when did it seep in? Because, you know, for, let me, let me hear you. Let me hear your story. Where did porn seep into all this? When did it start? And when did it become um, unmanageable? Right. Cause that's, that's pretty much what addiction is. Your life is becoming unmanageable because something else is taking it over. Yeah, man. And it's, it's something I ignored for, for a really long time. You know, I, 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 I think where, you know, to answer the question, where did it, where did it come in? I'm glad you asked a question with my age, because I think it's important to have that context. My introduction to pornography was, you know, I, I'm assuming your audience is, is a little bit older demographic. You know, I do speak to a lot of young men in their early twenties. Like they see this thing on the internet, like, you know, six, seven, eight years old. For me, the first entry point was, you know, dad's magazine. You know, I think probably a lot of men are going to resonate that you're kind of nosing around, you know, dad's drawers, you kind of see something you look in it and it's this feeling of like curiosity like oh why does that body make me feel this way and it wasn't even like soft core like playboy stuff like my dad was into like the really hardcore stuff so from six years old like i was exposed to some real graphic material but then i remember man i think i think i was 15 when we got 
you know, like the first computer, like with real dial up, like kind of, kind of internet, you know, like if somebody picks up the phone, it kicks off. Dude, that first day on the internet, man, like, I don't know what it was. I don't know what told me to go look for it, but I remember landing in a chat room and, and starting conversations and starting to exchange pictures with people, like just randomly on the internet, 15 years old. And at that point, it's like, dude, everything I could ever possibly think I need at that age is right here on the computer. Like, and a limited amount of, of, of naked women, like I'm all for it. Like it was obviously old school dial up. So, I mean, it's not what we deal with today, um, but it was like the slow kind of downloading processing. It's like pixel by pixel by pixel. You're kind of like getting an image downloaded. Um, and then one thing I was doing in my early twenties, 21, 22, one of the jobs I had was working in the wireless industry. So I was a sales rep for a team mobile distributor. Um, so we had early access to like the Blackberry phone, you know, it was kind of like the, the first smartphone ever created. And I remember that, getting that and being like, Oh, that stuff that I was like finding on the computer. I now have it with me 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I would say that's probably when the real addiction became because, you know, I was making good money at a time. So my life was going well, I guess the way that I saw it then, um, you know, I had this internet thing where I could kind of find it anywhere. And if I was having a stressful day, instead of going to smoke a cigarette, like some people would do working in a mall, like I would go into like a big kind of, you know, a department store upstairs and I, Dillard's Dillard's would, would be the place. Every mall in Tampa has a Dillard's. So I'd go upstairs in the private restroom, sit in the handicapped spot. You could be in there for an hour not a person would come in. So this would be where I would, you know, I would take my quote unquote smoke breaks and it would be a porn break. So I knew like back then that it was probably a problem. You know, most guys watch pornography, I think is what, you know, a lot of people are going to say, but I don't think most guys are taking breaks in the middle of the day to go watch it while they're supposed to be working. So that's when I kind of early on, you know, in my twenties knew it was a problem. And then as I got into kind of some serious relationships through my twenties, you know, I would get off of it, you know, if the relationship was going well, but I always found myself back into it. And then I remember one relationship specifically, like I thought I was good at like hiding everything and deleting it. Somehow she was able to find like the real history. And she's like, what is this? And it became a massive, massive problem in our relationship. Uh, so this is like late twenties, early thirties, the real, you know, there's, there's, there's been there's been a few different points that have been really pivotal for me. I think one was was meeting Vince in that first event um, at at Toronto. You know, when when Luch came up and talked, like I was kind of taken back. Like at the time, I wasn't a believer. I didn't really have faith or or religion growing up as a kid. Like, you know, it wasn't something that was really talked about in our home. So when I got in that environment with Vince, and you know, Vince is somebody that he leads with his faith, and to hear Luch talk at that first event, like as a strong kind of man, like talk about the importance of faith and all these things, it it, it began to kind of really get me to think a little bit. So I came back to Tampa. You know, I get connected with the guys over there at Critical Bench, Mike, Dan Long, a few people that we're talking about before we hit record here so spending time with them like on a weekly basis begin to show me the model of like what it means to be like a real strong man like a leader in your home a leader in your community and i didn't understand it at the beginning but the first like six months eight months i'm like what is what is it about these guys like why are they different than everybody else that that i ever spent time with or ever ever hung out with about eight months into it i realized like all of these men lead their lives first through their faith so you know, to kind of make a long story short here, you know, I surrendered my life to Christ on October 18th of, or October 22nd of 2018. Um, in those first, you know, four months, like there's a Christian, like, I got no clue what I was doing. You know, my, my, my spiritual mentor was like, dude, find a church, like start showing a church regularly. It's like, just open your Bible up. I was like, what do I read? He's like, just read Matthew, like just start reading every day. And, and the book will speak to you and, and, and God will show you what you need to read. But I didn't understand that first. So as we turn the clock, it's funny, we're recording this kind of, you know, new, new years, you know, 2022. So as we turn the clock in 2019, like I was ready to really clean up my life. I was drinking too much. I was spending a little bit too much time partying. Um, and this was after me being saved. And, you know, I was also also watching porn. So I spent that first month of January, no, no alcohol, no drugs, no partying, nothing, lost 21 pounds, got on the carnivore diet. And then a, and then I had a conversation with somebody on February 14th of 2019. And this was with uh, a man that I respect a lot, like a former Marine, very strong kind of alpha presence. He's actually episode two of, of, of my podcast. But out of nowhere, he starts talking about his porn addiction and how he was using breathing exercises to kind of overcome and harness some of his sexual energy. And it was the first time I ever had another guy 
openly confess that he had a problem with pornography. Now at that point, I'd already been thinking about my own issue. I'd already been kind of researching, like, what is this doing to my brain? Is there a way out of this? How do I find freedom? But I hadn't had a conversation with anybody. It was all kind of internalized. But him sharing what he was going through kind of like gave me the freedom to be like, okay, here's, here's your time, Frank. Like, just see where this conversation is gonna go. So it's ironic, you know, it was a day of love there. I was in a relationship at the time, something that, you know, was was a very big reason why for me at the beginning, because we were about two and a half years into our relationship. And it was at the point where it's like, now or never, you know, do or die. Like, is this going to be the future or are you guys going to part, you know, and go your separate ways? But I knew that if we were really going to pursue moving forward, like she needed to know the truth. So I made a vow on that day, February 14th, 2019. I'm going to repeat it probably, you know, a few more times here because I think it's so fundamental. I made a vow to Zach. I said, brother, I want to thank you for you sharing this because it's given me the freedom now to talk about my own struggles. And I made a commitment to him. I said, I'm never looking back. I'm committed to removing this thing out of my life, but I need to do two things. Zach, I need you to hold me accountable. Will you be my accountability partner? He said, absolutely, brother, anything you need. The second thing I said, I need to let Stephanie know the truth about who I am and what I'm doing. Like, I don't think it was any secret that maybe I've watched porn, but I don't think she really understood that it was a porn addiction. Um, so the next day, that morning, you know, I kind of go into my 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 uh, closet at home here uh, where I had a secret computer. Like, I literally had a computer that nobody else had the password to. The only thing I did was watch pornography on it because of that previous relationship in my early 20s where I'd gotten caught. So I'm like, nobody's ever going to catch me again. So I grab the computer, walk into the room where she's at getting ready for the day. And I'm like, you know, hey, Steph, like, I just, you know, I want to kind of have a conversation with you. She gave me this odd look, like, why are you holding a computer? So I go, I know you kind of, I know, you know, I probably watch porn, you know, somewhat regularly, but I don't think you really understand the severity of my addiction. And it was put all out there. You know, I just confessed everything to her. We're both getting extremely emotional. She's breaking down crying, but I'm like, I'm telling her, like, I'm so committed to getting inside of my life. I'm going to do whatever it can. And I'm going to start by destroying like the direct line that I have. And I took the laptop and it sounds impressive when I say that I destroyed a laptop with my hand, but I just ripped it apart. You know, it's two pieces that kind of fold together, but I had one piece in each hand. I literally tore it apart down the middle, you know? So that was kind of a cool part of the story. And then, you know, I, I followed up with Zach, you know, and I knew then, like I knew that day that something was gonna come out of this. I couldn't tell you what it was back then, but I knew that this was gonna be a foundational part of the beginning of a new journey for me. So that was February 15th, 2019. Now those next three months, man, like everything in my life changed. Literally the way that I saw the world began to change. I understand it now through a neuroscience lens because my brain rebooted and I, and I got free of this addiction. But I said, other people need to know about this. If, if this has happened to me, like other people need to hear this story. And that was the genesis for me starting the podcast, The Superman Life, is I just wanted to put this story out there in the world. And I saw an opportunity because I was somebody that had achieved things. I was a high performer, you know, competing at a high level bodybuilding, really studying personal development, studying psychology, studying all these high performance principles. If I was still struggling with this addiction, what about the guys that don't have my toolbox? Like, what are they doing? Like, because for me, I don't want to say it was easy, but when I made that decision, like, yeah, it was tough from a discipline and willpower standpoint, but I'd learned all that 10 years competing as a bodybuilder, like how to deny yourself, how to do the thing when it's, when it's not what you want to do, how to not give in to temptation to eat a cookie. It's all the same kind of psychological things that have to take place. Certain character traits are necessary, but I had those, but I know that there's millions of men that don't. And that's not a knock at them if I say you don't have the character traits. It's just you haven't put yourself in a position to learn and develop those things. So that's why I started the podcast was I just needed to put this story out there. You know, I was running Frank Rich Fitness at the time. I was also working uh, for a marketing agency um, with Rudy Maurer. I think you probably know yeah, Rudy. Yeah, Rudy. Well, I was working, working with Rudy. Um, so that was that was it, man. I didn't I didn't see a coaching business. I didn't see anything that we're really doing today other than a place for me to have conversations about my story and my journey and to invite other people on. About six months into the, the podcast, though, like everything changed, man. Again, like people went from sending me messages and emails daily, like, thank you for your muscle building tips. Thank you for helping me build 10 pounds of muscle or help me lose 15 pounds of pat, which is great. Like, I love that. I love that I can help somebody change the way that the physique looks. The messages start to be, thank you for your openness. Thank you for your vulnerability to have this conversation. And then can you help me? And I was like, wait a minute. I don't know if I could help you. Like I just flipped the switch and kind of decided to change. So I was like, M maybe, uh, and this will get us now to like early 2020, right before the pandemic. 
I was at an event, I was at one of Vince's event and they were teaching this kind of like, you know, SMS post tactic where you kind of put, you know, put a post out there. I'm looking for five guys that do this and want to achieve Ooh. this. And I was like, okay, this looks like something I'm like, let me see, let, let me see what happens if I put this. So I, I literally that week and like, I put the post out there, threw it up on my Instagram, which my Instagram was only been talking about muscle building at this point. Like I had no mention of porn, maybe a little bit of my story through the podcast, but it was still Ooh. about building muscle and i said hey i'm looking for five guys that are sick and tired of living with their secret habit and are committed to removing porn out of their life in the next four months i'll personally coach you provide the support accountability and everything you need to reboot your brain that day there's six thousand dollars in my bank account Jeez. not not there before but six thousand came in like from from that post and it said okay shit now i got to build a program like because i you know I, I sold it before i had it d d develop different topic there marketing you know marketing concept but um that was it man that was a genesis of rebuilt recovery you know february 2020 landed the first few clients and and those clients were really allowed me to build the curriculum in real time because i got real life feedback i got real input from this is working this isn't working this didn't make sense this week can you refine this and now we've obviously spent the last year and a half almost two years really perfecting that program but that's that's it man i don't i don't remember the original question because i kind of oh, took it all over the place there, no but, that, that you, you went exactly where you needed to go because i asked you about how this all got started and and your porn addiction and that was perfect i think you know i got a lot of things here so this is great um so it's funny because you, you mentioned something, the, the demographic of a lot of the men who are going to be listening to this and women are going to be in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and, and, and 70s. And I know that for me, right, for me, porn started, you know, I'm 52. So I, I lived porn in magazines at first, obviously, you know, dad would bring home magazines or you know, you go to the store. Then beta, beta, uh, uh, you know, not VHS, but beta right beta max you put those those movies in and and satellite I, this is i think this is pretty me <laughs> yeah yeah I mean, beta, beta with the small smaller smaller things before bhs you put the the big heavy you know solid beta um beta max into your into your vcr and then satellites you know like my 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 dad used to come home with like um you know, uh, like like most fathers i guess i don't know but my I mean, my dad did kept, came home with a lot of you know betas with um, satellite stuff on there, and and um, you know, so during my during my high school, it was it, it wasn't it wasn't available like on the there was no web there was no mm -hmm. online so you had to work to get it, and then when you got it you're like okay guys let's come over to my house and let's watch some you know let's watch a because porn back then was like a whole story like it was literally like a movie like you're sitting down mm -hmm. watching a movie, and then in university you know at Queens University we used to have a, a porn night which was really more just social but have it in the background old school you're just kind of making fun of it you're not really like you know what I mean and then. You know, for, for me, porn was kind of like if I was drinking or or what have you, then, I, you know, I may look at it. But it wasn't really a massive thing for me because I would go to strip joints and do all that stuff. Like I'd go like literally live because it wasn't something that was readily available. And then when it, be, when it became ready, readily available, I was just too old and too focused on other things to really understand. Oh, yes, you can get it at the tip of your fingers. But but and, and I'm sure, like I say, the demographic a lot of people can relate to my story because in regards to like how I, you know, viewed porn back when I, in the early days, but there's, they have, we have kids, right? We have, we have sons, mm. we have, we have kids, um, daughters, sons, whomever it is um, that can get, get very affected by this. And even younger, younger kids too, that can be affected. And we have to have that conversation, um, you know, as fathers um, and mentors to ensure that, you know, it's not, it's not, may not be a problem. I'm, you know what I mean? Like I got a 20, I don't know, it's 25 years old now, but I mean, you know, I don't know. I'm going to ask him, Hey man, do you watch porn all the time? Or, you know, it's just a question that it's kind of like the birds and the bees, the, you know, are you doing drugs and are you watching porn? Because it can become a massive problem. And I'm, you know, one of the things that, that I want to ask you is, and this is, this may be with you, but you're coaching now you're doing a lot of coaching and mentoring men and helping them with porn addiction. So you must you know, know about, about what's going on with porn in general, like how, how it's affecting many men. 
and and first and foremost how does that affect the way people look at women how does that affect the way men look at women because i know that there's the incels and there's all this other stuff you know we had a big we had a massive incident that happened here in toronto where a guy jumped a guy who's an incel um which are guys who hate women and hate good looking guys and you know i don't i don't know the deep deep into it but my wife kind of gives me the overview of what incels are and then uh because she works in the, she works in, as a as a uh in forensics and so anyway he jumped in his car and ran over and killed a whole bunch of people um down our street and my wife had to was one of the, the forensics who was uh, processing the scene um and so so how does porn affect guys uh and women like that relationship mm. Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you added all of that with your story. I, I, I appreciate you sharing that, man. We, we have coached a lot of men and, and our, our range of men that I've worked with is 18. You know, I obviously can't work with children, but I have worked with an 18 year old high school senior and I've coached guys into their sixties. So it does affect everybody, no matter what your age is. And I think it's important to, when, when we're going to talk about everything from this point on the effects, the harm, the side effects, yeah. I want to preface it under the context that where we're going to go now is talking about internet streaming pornography it is a completely different drug it is a completely different animal than everything that you talked about the magazines the vhs all the other stuff what what is referred to in the neuroscience world this is this is not my terminology this is coming from doctors and research and people that are exploring and researching the dopamine reward circuits in our brain Pornography is identified and recognized as what's known as a super normal stimulus. So everything we're doing right now, there's 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 obviously a lot of kind of going on behind the scenes in our brain. There's synapses and firing and things are kind of happening all the time when you're consuming. As people are listening, when I say certain things, trigger certain responses. So everything we're consuming is creating responses in our brain. What happens with pornography though is A, because it's so readily available, there's an infinite amount of supply, 165 years of pornography on the internet right now, you'd have to sit down straight for 165 years just to consume the, the amount of pornography that's on one site. So it's all this readily available and every new video creates a new neural response. So first, second exposure, what ends up happening is create a new baseline of dopamine in your brain. So dopamine is what's referred to as the currency of, of addiction, the currency of motivation in, in your brain. So you establish a new baseline because it's that first hit, it's like, whoa, this is something like my brain is not, not created or not wired to handle. It's super normal. Like there's nothing in the natural world that'll create the stimulus response of dopamine that you get from pornography. Yes, some hardcore drugs, you know, meth, cocaine, like these real high dopaminergic drugs. And I'm not saying porn is the same as coke. Like that's not what I'm trying to say. The response in our brain though is very, very similar. Now you asked about the, the like the perception of women and what it does to the male's brain. So they've, they've, they've put scans on the person's brain while watching pornography. And we have different circuits and they're different areas of our brain. When you watch pornography, the part of the brain that's lights up is the part of your brain that is associated with recognizing and identifying objects. Okay, so when I see this cup here sitting on my desk, if I was gonna gr go grab it, there's a part of my brain before I can actually reach out and grab it, that's gonna say, that's a cup, that's an object. I need to go grab it to pick it up. The different part of your brain when you like when I look at you, when I see you, there's a different part of the brain that is activated. That's the part for relationship. That's a part for connection. What they've noticed is through brain scans is when you're watching pornography, the part of the brain that lights up is a part that is associated with objects. Okay, so where this leads you to is men talk about I objectify every single woman that I look at. Because through neuroscience, what fires together, wires together. So every time you sit down and watch pornography, your brain is lighting up in the object center, but you're seeing the human physique. You're seeing a person or what you believe is a person. So you're beginning to wire those connections that when I see people, people become objects in my life. So this can be sexual objectification, or this can be where a lot of relationships in my life went in my thirties. It's like, it was no more about a mutual relationship. It was what, what are you going to do for me? What financial gain are you going to bring to me? What fun game, what, you know, what party game, whatever it was, every relationship that I had became transactional. It became part of like an object. It was a relationship, not with a person, but a relationship with the object, the person that I have. So that's probably the biggest thing that I just wanted to make sure that we, we get across is literally you're wiring and programming yourself that when you see people, you begin to identify them as objects. 
I'm not really well versed on the incel community, so I can't really speak a lot to what you're saying there. Obviously, you know that they're out there. I think that mo many of those guys, like if I could get my hands on them for 90 to 120 days and reboot their brain, their entire perspective on the world would change. I think so. I 100% think so too. And um, wow, that, that that was big. I love how you brought neuroscience into this because you know um, that connection is very important. I always tell people that you know we don't our prefrontal cortex is is where we make the 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 most the the most um, important decisions in our life. Executive, lives. yeah, executive, executive function. Absolutely, and so that doesn't happen. That doesn't con completely um, develop until you're tw twenty one. Um, now, this is when I was in university, when I was doing neuroscience, it was 21. I don't know what it is now, but it's 21. So you're thinking an 18, 19, 20 year old, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and 21 year old who doesn't have that prefrontal cortex. Now their brain is totally messed up and not just that person, but because your prefrontal cortex can be damaged in many different ways throughout the life. Specifically, if you're addicted to something, that thing is all that this is, you know, you don't have those, those those um inhibitions anymore right like your inhibitions drop your your uh you know what you what, what's what you think is right and what you think is wrong that's totally messed up just because of that consistent and constant addiction to whatever it is um but do you but but does it become a problem so like let's say that i've been i'm watching porn i'm watching porn and now i'm watching the same thing but obviously i'm not i shouldn't say obviously but some people they they kick it up a notch they keep it kicking it up they keep kicking it up okay this is not stimulating me anymore mm -hmm. i need you hit thresholds it's just like drugs right like you do the first one is amazing now you're still chasing that first one but now you're trying now you're doing more or now you're changing your drug of choice or now you're adding people to your drug party or whatever it is is that the same thing with porn like you do you hit that threshold and you start going okay now i'm going to watch uh orgies now i'm going to watch freaking mm -hmm you know, uh, she -mails. Now I'm going to watch freaking uh, people who, who are missing limbs. Now I'm like, 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 <laughs> does that just <clears throat> keep going? And then when you hit a point where it's like, I need real stuff now. Like, is, is it, is that, is that mm. even, is that something that, that you've, you've come across? Brother, such an important conversation right now. Mm -hmm. Such an important conversation that we're about, we're about to have. Absolutely. What you just described there in, in the addiction, you know, space is identified and, and it's called the sensitization desensitization effect you know that first hit i've done you know i don't say i've done a lot of drugs but i've done my fair amount of them in in my life that first hit of cocaine like i never was able to duplicate that ever again like the feeling that it gave me same thing happens with pornography we talked about first second exposure reestablishes a new baseline for your brain you never with that same type of uh content will receive that hit again so this is where you begin to chase certain things you begin to get into you know you probably start with maybe some vanilla porn one guy one girl then it becomes one guy two girls then it becomes 10 guys one girl then it becomes you know you talked about the shemale you talked about the the gangbang you talked about you know the gay stuff like whatever it is i don't want to get too you know specific here i'll kind of let people's brains kind of kind of take where, where they want to go um but there's there's a there's a powerful book and it's a part it's a mandatory read in our coaching program it's called surfing for god and the author michael john cusack talks about how his porn addiction led him into the realm of escorts led him into the realm of prostitution seeking out strip clubs and i've had a lot of conversations as well with people in the human trafficking space i don't know how much you want to get into that but you don't end up at the point of purchasing sex from from a trafficked victim without going through the pornography tunnel first and, right. and, and I believe that to my core. Nobody ends up buying sex if they have, if they don't struggle with a massive, massive porn addiction. So mm. absolutely, brother. And it's something that, that I experienced as well. The things that I was watching, you know, in my 30s, my mid 30s, late 30s, when I finally, well, mid 30s, because I'm in my late 30s now, was not the same stuff that I was, that I was into. And then it gets even more more dangerous when you begin to try to bring that into your relationship this was something mm. that i struggled with because i thought i had these certain desires and needs so i had a woman that was willing to you know sleep with me it's like well why can't we just do the stuff that i'm hooked on it caused a lot of tension and mm. in real you know uh fights within our relationship because like why won't you do these things i'll just go get this from pornography so very important very important conversation right now because mm. absolutely like once you establish that new baseline it becomes like i need more and more hardcore graphic materials and this is where you be kind of get that chaser effect like Anybody that's had like a coke problem, like you'll spend all night looking for the next the next hit. Like you know, if you got a massive problem with pornography, it's not about the finish. 
Many mm -hmm. times it's the pursuit of finding that next image. Like I'll talk to a lot of guys. They're like, I watched porn for eight hours today, but it was like 20 to 30 second clips. And I was on to the next video because the dopamine comes in the pursuit of the goal. Like dopamine is a, is a chemical of motivation. So mm. it's designed to help us go out there and tackle the world and create businesses and build skyscrapers. But the pursuit of the next pornography is, is really where the guys show they're like next video, next video, next video. So yeah, I hope I answered your question there, but a hundred. Oh yeah. Yeah. Totally. And totally. in, 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 in hijacks that for sure. Because it does hijack your, like for me anyways, I remember um, in my thirties, uh, when I had a girlfriend and at that point I was still kind of, I was watching porn cause I was doing drugs and I was watching porn and I was kind of like, but I didn't like to, I didn't like to, 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 to co, co I didn't like to co-mingle both of them. Porn was separate, relationship was separate, but I was having problems, um, coming. I was having problems finishing because mentally I just, I, I, there was no connection. The, the porn disconnected me with reality. And so, and then, you know, whenever I was masturbating, I'd be masturbating the porn. And then later on, like the, so then when I reached my, my forties or early forties, I realized that that was a problem. So I had to start to re wire my mind mm -hmm. and really like what I was. So when my new, well, with my relationship with my wife, I don't even know if I'm, well, my wife doesn't know this, but anyway, so I would be now when I'm doing, you know, masturbating or whatever, pleasure myself, I'd be thinking about my wife and I would, mm. I, would I would, it wouldn't be porn. Porn's not out because I want that relationship to be connected so that when we are together, it's a magical moment. Right. So I have to disconnect from, I had to disconnect from that before and just think about, you know, like that's, I'm just thinking about nice things that I've seen before with my wife and putting that in my head when I'm doing myself so that when it really happens, it, I'm there. Like I'm, I'm actually there with her doing what I was thinking about before. It's amazing. It's actually, yeah, it literally, <laughs> you, under, you understand this because you, you understand because you study the brain and neuroscience a lot here, you know, yeah. what fires together, wires together. So attaching the act of ejaculation or the, you know, masturbation and release to yeah. visual images versus real intimacy, yes. like you begin to create, that is the pathway for you to get to that end right. result. Like yeah. I've had conversations with men that literally will have to watch pornography while right. having sex or watch pornography, like while, you know, while their girlfriend is, 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 is kind of going down on them just mm -hmm. to kind of keep it, keep it up. And one other thing I wanted to talk about, because we talked, we briefly touched on the kids and kind of how it distorts like your own perception of reality and what real sex and intimacy is. I'm yeah. not sure if you saw the Billy, the, the Billy Eilish, thing that came out she's a pop star no. here in the states in in december so uh young girl you know young woman yeah. i think probably in her late teens maybe i think she might be in her early 20s like billy eilish is is her name yeah. she was on the howard stern um show or whatever he whatever he calls whatever it is that he's doing mm -hmm. but she talked about how she was introduced to pornography at like 11 years old and over time because she got into these hardcore things that we described why it happens this began to kind of distort her perception of what sex is and i've heard a talk i've heard a talk it was uh by Clay clayton who's the founder of Fight the New Drug, incredible kind of anti-porn organization, really raising awareness. He shares a story about a young boy, 12, 13 years old, you know, kid's excited, like he's got kind of like a little girlfriend, he wants to go on a date with his girlfriend. So the parents are like, we don't want you going out in public, why don't you just bring her, you know, over to the house, we'll set you guys up in the car, you can kind of have like an outdoor kind of car kind of driving thing. I don't know if they had a movie playing, but they were just kind of let the kids kind of hang out in the front yard, you know, inside of the car. They leave them be, you know, 13 years old, we'll check on, you know, every couple hours, whatever, <laughs> We want you guys to have your kind of freedom. They return back like to go check on the kids and the kid literally has his hands around the girl's throat. Like she's kind of like holding on. She's like, what the hell is going on? And she, he literally is all like simulating, like strangling her and they pull him out of the car. They're like, what, what are you doing? They're like, well, I love her. Like, is it what I'm supposed to do? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. so this kid had been like, literally he'd been introduced to porn and he'd seen this hardcore abuse graphic material and it literally warped his perception of what real sex was, he thought he was supposed to strangle mm. a girl that he had feelings for. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, we, we can go so far down that hole. I have a lot of podcasts, you know, for the parenting stuff. I had a, mm. I had a guest on called Chris McKenna, who runs an organization called Protect Young Eyes. But that's something I'm really passionate about because mm. those kids are the future, you know, like, like, I got maybe, you know, 60 years left uh, on this earth and then it's, I'm gone, but I want to make sure that, that it's, we, we leave it good. Mm. These kids growing up, like this is, this is our future. Like we need to educate them. We need to have the real honest, vulnerable conversations with them. Like Chris says, like porn should be the most popular word in your house. If you have kids. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to make sure we kind of, kind of added that caveat there with, with the ability. We are, we are definitely going to revisit this, um, 
specifically in the parenting, because this conversation we're having right now is about anyone who's listening. Well, it's about everybody, but anyone who's listening, who has that problem, who knows they have that problem, you need to reach out to Frank and you need to listen to this entire podcast. We're not done yet, but I'm just throwing that out here. And then after that, after they hear this, we need to have another podcast episode about parenting because you said something very, 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 very important. It is a different world out there. Just, just with my guys, with my over 40 alpha men who, who use this program, a lot of them struggled at the beginning because they didn't know how to use the app. They, they weren't there. They also, I'm not computer savvy or whatever the words they use when they, 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 you know, they, they email, uh, customer service and still to this day there's a lot who kind of struggle with the online thing but that's just because we're we, you know at our age we weren't really you know th- we, we we grew up at an older age in this uh you know technology world your kids your grandchildren live in it so at the as soon as they get a phone i'm not even gonna say the computer now because the, the computer seems to be even more it starts it's starting to become more archaic right the only people who really use computers is people who have you know jobs or whatever but the young the young kids are on the phones and it's it's readily available 100 100 whether you think you're you can put the protection on or not they're going to find it and they're going to get it and 100 percent. So- i just want to i want to add something there i know you you know you probably do some paid direct you know direct advertising like they don't even have to go look oh, for it shit. the minute they get that phone in their hand it's looking for them. Right. And I think that's where we need to understand. Yeah. Like, I, 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 you know, I, I say that the, the sex exploitation industry, so I'm going to bring pornography and human trafficking into one umbrella. Sex mm-hmm. exploitation is one of the strongest forces of evil in the world. It is coming for you. It is coming for your kids. And if you do not educate yourself and are not aware of the dangers, it could be I've had conversations with parents that like download videos off of YouTube. And it's like, the minute I download this video, I got to put my kid to the side because I know I'm going to get hit with a pornography advertisement. You know, if the kids are on social media, like Instagram knows that it's a boy, Instagram knows that it's a a male. And if they can get you hooked on this thing, it's going to keep on their app so much longer. So these algorithms can be our friend if we understand how they work, but they can also be our enemy. And I think that's the important thing to understand is like, you don't even have to think that your kids need to go out there and look for it because the minute they have that phone in their hand, it's going to start looking and finding them. That was huge, actually. That was very powerful because I didn't even, you know, I know about that because you just click on one picture on Instagram and now you look at your search and it's every picture is that the same as that one picture. Like, wait a minute, I was in fitness a second ago or I was shopping a second ago and this one thing came up. Why are my God, why do I have asses in my face? Uh, to, you know, in my search, I literally clicked one thing because of the, because I'm trying to find my wife, a, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 what do you call it again? A leggings. And mm-hmm. yes, it was nice leggings. So I clicked it and now I got G strings in my face. Like what the hell? And then I realized, oh, of course I have G strings in my face because I clicked that one thing. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, and it went down that hole. So you're absolutely right. It, it's coming for them. It's already it's already there. So now that conversation has to be used. So we're definitely going to have another podcast episode about parenting, but now I want to turn into this pandemic because the pandemic has isolated many, many, many people. So I can only imagine how uh, intensified porn addiction has become. I don't know stats, but it must have become more intense uh, in regards to like more people getting addicted and really living in that isolation because addiction happens in isolation a lot of times. Right? It starts starts everywhere, and then you know you begins you begin to isolate. Um, what did you what, what have you found um, with the pandemic? Yeah, so for me, like I like I said, you know, I I really got started, you know really deeply in the work right at the beginning of the pandemic. So I don't know a lot, like I don't have a lot of, you know, my own kind of anecdotal evidence of working in the space pre pandemic because right, right, right. February 2020. And then, you know, by the middle of March, like the world was kind of shut down. One of the first videos that I did shoot though, was how to stay porn free during, you know, during the coronavirus lockdown. I think we were going to do two days or two weeks to flatten the curve. Like it's now two plus years, <laughs> hey, whatever the hell. Um, but yeah, man, you, you hit on a few things that I don't have, you know, I don't have stats as far as like how porn addiction has risen, but addiction in general is like up like 300% depression, you know, anxiety, suicide, all these numbers shot through, shot through the roof, man. So, 
Um, and I mean, once again, just talking about like the, the forces of evil, like, you know, Pornhub, like one of the biggest sites in the world came out offering like free memberships to their like platinum thing right at the beginning of, 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 of the pandemic. So I would have to assume that it's, it's, it's obviously shot numbers through the roof, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that you said there. Addiction does feed itself in, in isolation. So, you know, if you're still in an era that is, that is struggling with lockdown, like maybe you can't meet with people in person regularly, get in some type of online community, you know, join the, join the alpha 40 men, you know, join one of our groups where yes. we meet you know, weekly with a man, but you got to have something where you're, you're meeting and you're having conversations with people on a regular basis. And then obviously, you know, controlling your devices, not going, you know, not taking your phone to your bedroom, things like that. So a lot of, you know, real, real tactics and, and hacks that you can do. Um, but we need people, man. Like we were wired for, for intimacy. We we're wired yeah. for a relationship. It's a part, like if, if, if you're born, you know, and you're never touched, like, and they've, they they got some research out of like you know monkeys. Russia and like this, yeah the sixties and the recent monkeys yeah yeah like you'll you'll die like it's an important yeah. part so you need connection you need intimacy you need relationships with people so yeah, yeah. assuming that's probably shot numbers to the roof but I don't have I don't have those stats like no worries man. yeah so so the other thing is um you know just if you're listening to this too like and you do know they have a problem you, you have to man up not man up I don't want to say man up sorry you don't have to sorry I should not have said that. You have to understand that connecting with Frank is going to be safe, right? Like it's a safe place and it's a safe place to be vulnerable and it's a safe place to change because, because, you know, one of the things that I always tell the guys in my program is we don't judge. There's no judgment. Like you come in and you're 300 pounds and you take that first picture. We don't, nobody's judging you because you're 300 pounds. They're, they're saying, okay, listen, this is where you are today. You're not going to be here in 60 days. You're not going to be here in 90 days. You're not going to be here in a year because not only are you, do you have a, a program, but you also have us to help you. So we're going to help you through this. No one ever judges. Oh, that first workout was really, really hard. Guy, someone's in like phase 23. They, the first thing they say is, yes, I remember how tough that workout was, buddy. Just keep going. They don't go, ah, oh, man up. You know, I'm in phase 23. I'm, do, you know, been doing this for two years. No, no, it's always, oh, dude, I remember that workout. I remember those, that one exercise. And then it just allows people to become more vulnerable. And this, and, and although, and porn is a very taboo thing that needs, like you said, it needs to be in every household. That word has to be something that you talk about all the time it needs to be uncovered it needs to be released because if it's not then the isolation and the mm. will continue and the problems will continue um so yeah yeah like, well i think it's important too man just to, to address man if you're struggling with this like you're not in the minority right you're in the majority yes you know 70 to 80 percent of men that have been questioned or have you know participated in a in a survey admit to having some type of problem this is 78 percent of men that are willing to participate in a survey how many men won't actually admit it so how high could that number potentially be so if you're out there in and, and, and this is a problem or maybe you're thinking it could be or you just want to have a conversation with somebody you are not by yourself like you are in fact in the majority of men right now in the world so i think maybe looking at it through that lens can kind of lift some of that guilt lift some of that shame and many times it's literally i tell all the guys like we offer free consultation calls you know like we're not going to try to sell you anything we just want to have conversations many of the men's lives change just like mine did on february 14th when i found a safe place to have a conversation mm -hmm. so if anything I just want to open up a place to have a conversation because something can only cause shame in your life if you don't openly admit it. The minute that you say that this is a problem and I'm looking to do something about it, the shame has now been removed. So I don't know if you've ever read the book Power Power versus Force. Like shame is like the lowest level of consciousness. It's like death and then shame. So just getting you out of shame and openly having a conversation will begin to move you in the right direction to finding freedom in your life. Power versus force. That's amazing. What you just said there is incredible. And Dr. Uh, David Hawkins. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hawkins. Um, yeah, that is so that is so incredible. Um yeah. So so let's let's two more things. One is 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 there a place that people could go? Like uh, you know, I go to Narcotics Anonymous because I'm a I'm a recovering addict, uh, but but porn anonymous like is are, i'm sure there's something like that sex, sex is it is there something like that yeah, or, so, like you know, it's so new right 
Yeah, man. You know, like even when I got started and in what's happened in just these last two years, like the conversation has completely changed. When you look in the DSM-5, which is the book that kind of recognizes addiction, it's a clinical book. Pornography addiction is nowhere to be found in there. So the treatment in terms of like groups would be done through an SAA, which would be a sex, you know, sex uh, alcoholics or, or sex addiction anonymous. Oh. So there are those type type of categories. The only problem in, and I'm a fan, like I'm not here to knock AA or any of those organizations because no. I think they done more good for addiction community than any other organization the mm -hmm. problem i have is that every day you need to raise your hand and identify yourself as an addict a lot of our work is centered around an identity change taking you from the mm -hmm. person that is struggling and equipping you with the tools to live a life without pornography so i'm not a fan mm -hmm. of you every day like having to raise your hand and say i'm mm -hmm. addicted to porn i'm addicted to porn let's admit mm -hmm. that there's a problem but the minute that we're committed to change like let's put that past self behind mm -hmm. us and let's mm -hmm. create a new identity for who you are so there are those type of communities out there and in in if if that's what you're looking for, you know, um, the church is not doing a great job right now. I think only 4% of churches are saying or say that they have a problem that specifically treats this. It's something that I'm passionate about, you know, and, and we'll see in the future what we can do to help, you know, the, the, the churches and, and whatnot with other programs and groups. But yeah, SAA would be the place to go if you're looking for just a type of community. Um, but reach out to me, man. You know, we, we have yeah, like resources, we have groups in, in everything. That's what I was gonna say. That's why I call myself a recovering addict because uh, I know that if I don't do the things I need to do, then I can get right back in there. And I think the same thing would be for porn addiction or any type of addiction. Um, yes, you're recovering, but you still need to work on your addiction every single day, or you can easily get back down to where you were before. Um, and so that that's why I think it's important to to. And, 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 and this is my other thing, too. I'm just getting out of context. But, but the, there's a difference between alcohol and narcotics. So the alcoholic who's coming in speaks totally different and is not as hardcore as a narcotics user. Like, mm -hmm. they, there, there are some that are, but, you know, it's like it's a different – It's yes, there's addiction. It's a different thing. So going to sex anonymous I don't think is going to – going to yeah, be it, a good enough a good enough connection to the porn because they're two, they're two different things although they're under the same umbrella that's why going to you is going to be key because you're focusing on that one thing and sometimes you can get lost in like what the hell is this person talking about i can't even relate because it is about relating to other people too when you have those conversations knowing that you're not alone knowing that there is 78 percent or 80 percent other other men out there who have the same problem when you do know that you're not alone and that there's a place you can go to help get, recover and to help push that to the to the i'm not that person anymore i'm i'm i've, I've just unleashed myself mm. and you know kind of just shed that off because we're always growing we're always getting we're always trying to be better every single day. We should be doing that. And that means shedding some of that old, uh, all those old habits. The only place you're going to go is Frank Rich, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's, that's amazing. Bro. I, I appreciate that. I'll tell you a quick story here about the, um, about the logo that we created, because it kind of resonates right with what you were saying there. But um, I want to touch on the alcohol thing real quick, because I had a doctor Please. on my podcast, Dr. Rob Kelly, um, yeah. out of Kelly Recovery Group in, in Texas, I believe is where he's at. Yeah. Um, this guy completely changed the way that I look at alcoholism, because I you know, as an uneducated person in the alcohol space, like looked at that addiction as the same as everything. Like you're holding on to a past identity. But what Rob shared with me on our talk is that the alcoholic's brain is different than every other brain. So there is something genetically predis predisposition for alcoholism. So that's why I think maybe that recovery approach works because mm -hmm. like we talked about the dopamine and kind of these neural pathways and stuff like that. With alcohol, like no matter how long you go without it, it's always going to, that next sip is always going to take you right back to the point oh. where you left. And this is where somebody can be completely clean of alcohol for three, five, 10, 30 years. And then one drink sets them down this, this, this escapade of just completely destroying their life once again. So the alcoholic brain is different than drug addicts is different than porn addicts. Mm -hmm. So yes, for those guys get into the AA recovery group, yeah. but yeah, you talked about kind of ripping this, you know, ripping the skin off and kind of getting rid of the old self. So you can see our logo here is actually a lion's face in inside of a phoenix so you know the phoenix is the symbol of death and resurrection so mm -hmm. we bring these men in you know there's there's an element of like kind of breaking you down at the beginning like you know i don't want to make you feel bad about yourself we've got to 
detach you from your old self and then release you back out into the world as a lion. So we take you from a broken man, we take you through that death and kind of resurrection of, you know, re reestablishing who you are. And we send you back out into the world as as a lion. So love it. that's kind of kind of cool. I love it, man. Thank you. know what? Uh, we are going to get on another podcast and talk about more. I think this is an important co a conversation that continue that needs to continue amongst people in general, men and women, but obviously, um, you know, I'm biased towards my over 40 alpha brothers. So, and men, men in their late thirties, forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies, who were trying to re re uh, you know, we're trying, we're trying to rebuild um, mm -hmm. a better community. And we can only do that when we rebuild ourselves and then we rebuild our families and our, we build our communities. So um, is there anything you want to leave us with before we, before we share where to find you because people are people are going to hear this and they're going to want to find you so where what's the last thing that we can leave with um before we part yeah man i think it's maybe just reinforcing you know what we talked about here a few a few minutes ago like if if you're out there and you're hearing this you're still with us first of all thank you for you know, sticking around i know it was obviously you know maybe not the most comfortable conversation to to listen to but if you're out there and this is something that you're thinking about like a for one just realize like you're not alone you're not on an island there is a way out of it you know we've we've had hundreds of, of transformations i myself have been an incredible transformation story but um you're not broken you know you don't need this in in your life it may feel like that right now now it may feel like there's no path out of it, but we have the tools, we have the resources, and we have the community to help you find freedom in your life. So that would maybe be my my parting words here is if you're struggling and you're thinking that you're the only one that's got this in your life right now, you're not. Um, so don't allow that to, to, to be what your identity is. And there is a path to freedom and we've proven that. Man, thank you so much. Where can some, I want, I don't want to, I want to know exactly where someone can reach out to you and ask for help first before we go into where we can reach you like to, to you know social media and all that stuff because yeah. there's who's, who's listening to this who needs help right now and they're like funk just tell me where the hell to reach frank quickly quickly best place to send me an email frank at rebuilt recovery.com again so send me an email and frank at rebuilt recovery.com and just say, Hey, you know, I heard you on Funk's podcast. We'll have to link up on a call with you and, you know, we'll figure, we'll figure something out. You can awesome. find me on Instagram. If you want to send me a DM on Instagram, it's at the superhuman Frank. Um, you know, and if you want to maybe kind of start working on this yourself, we have a free, we have a free resource. It's the seven steps to living life without porn. Uh, it's about 35 page kind of guided manual where we walk you through how to create a life without pornography. I'm very big on you're the creator of the life. You're the co-creator of your life. So you need to be proactive in building life that you want to have without pornography. So we walk you through that system. So it's a seven step guide to living life without porn. Um, you can find that at www the seven step guide.com and it's all spelled out. The seven step is spelled out S E V E N step guide.com. Love it. And then you are coming out with something. I don't know if I'm letting this out of the bag, but you are going to be coming out with something, right? Yes. Well, no, we do have a, we do have a course and program available. So if you're ready to, you know, if you're ready to take action and, and you're ready to start working, so it's 16 weeks uh, of dripped out videos, education curriculum. We talked about some of the reading resources. There's tons of, you know, there's, 40 hours of training videos specifically with me delivered in a step-by-step -step, uh 16 week system there we integrate a, a nutrition protocol there's supplementation there's a training as a part of it you know i obviously wanted to provide something uh you know i spent my lifetime mastering building muscle and training as like i needed to bring this into this as well so it's there's no porn addiction recovery there's very few porn addiction programs in the world but there's nothing that comes at it from a true holistic perspective so we have all the all the materials all the assignments to reboot rewire your brain we're gonna help you rebuild your your body not to take anything from what you know oh. funk is funk is doing here it would obviously be you know a supplement to what what you guys are doing inside the over uh, over 40 alpha program there but yeah it's uh it's a reboot your life is the name of the course Okay, we'll have all the links. We'll have everything uh, available for you guys on the on the podcast blog and and everywhere else. Frank, thank you so much, man. This has been amazing. Uh, I got goosebumps. I love it. I love this. I love addiction and talking about how to help men and women and people out of addiction. And this is one that uh, it definitely needs to be continued to have a light shined and shown shown on it, shined on it. <laughs> Either one. We, 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 we know put, what you're saying. We need to put the sun on it. That's what we need to I'm, do. I'm sure, I'm sure I butchered some words here today, so, so it's all good. Thank you so much, my brother, and uh, we'll talk soon, all right? Take care. Love you, brother.